Remember on the lectern? I feel like I should introduce our, our guests. Um, so I'm very out of practice doing this because we haven't had one of these since, uh, by my last count, uh, that I've hosted November of 2019. Uh, which I'm keenly aware might even be before some of you even went to Duke University, um, for which I apologize. Uh, but we're hopefully getting, you know, back in the swing of things. Uh, and uh, I think this is uh, a pleasurably outlier event that we're able to welcome you in person this semester. And hopefully in coming semesters, uh, it will be less of an outlier to have uh, a guest live and, and uh, in the flesh. Anyway. Um, enough about me reminiscing. First, because I've got a captive audience and because Paige is here, and if I don't do this, she gets really mean. Um, I, it would be remiss of me not to tell you about all the other great events that are coming up at which we hope to see you, such as, for example, Mike Abramowitz, the president and CEO of Freedom House for talk about expanding freedom and democracy around the world. Phil Richardson about leading change in the intelligence community. Gene Lee, the host of a really fantastic podcast called The Lazarus Heist, uh, talking about living uh, and reporting within the North Korean regime of Kim Jong-un, uh, and also a talk with Mike Sfraga about our strategic competition and cooperation in the Arctic. But you did not come here to hear about all of those very worthy issues. You came here to hear about the Cold War from the margins, a small socialist state on the global cultural scene. And you came to hear about it also not from me, but from our guest, Dr. Theodora Dagostinova, uh, who's coming to us, actually literally came to us from uh, Ohio State University where she's on faculty. Um, she's a specialist in Eastern European uh, cultural history. Uh, and we are thrilled to welcome you to Duke uh, and to hear from you about your latest book. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Simon, and thank you very much for those of you responsible for organizing this event. Wow, I'm everywhere. <laughs> this really feels like Big Brother, and I'm going to be talking to you about a small state uh, in the shadows of the Big Brother. So very appropriate. But first of all, thank you to the program in American Grant Strategy. Uh, especially to Simon Miles for inviting me and to my dear friend and colleague, Jennifer Siegel, whom you snatched from us at Ohio State. And now you have the pleasure of having her on your faculty new this year. It is pleasure being back with her. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Duke's Department of Political Science, um, Slavic and Eurasian Studies and History for co-sponsoring this event, and also to thank Paige Rotunda for handling the logistics associated with uh, this event. So let me jump in and talk to you about uh, my book or a little, you know, several sections of my book. Uh, I will start uh, with just giving you an idea of the key arguments I'm making in this book. And then I will zoom in on one smaller piece of the book to go in some detail and show you how exactly I am going about supporting these big uh, arguments. Um, so let's see, oh, there we go. A flurry of international events marked public life in late socialist Bulgaria. The visits of out of ordinary, often flamboyant public dignitaries such as Angela Davis from the United States that you can see on the bottom right. Uh, the appearance of recognizable Western cultural icons such as Tina Turner, that you can see on Bulgarian uh, TV. The exhibition of masterworks by Leonardo da Vinci at the Alexander Nesky Cathedral, or the showings of Rubens, Van Gogh, Monet, and Rembrandt at the National Gallery of Art. During the 1970s, one event stood out. The International Assembly of Children, that's the image on your left, which was held under the auspices of the United Nations in 1979 and brought uh, you know, thousands of children to Bulgaria to celebrate 10 days of being together. And what you're seeing here is this flag showing Uruguay, so the last part of the alphabet, Syria, the Soviet Union, Tanzania, Tunisia, Turkey, and Uruguay, and then India in the background. So you can see the various diverse countries that actually came to Bulgaria for um, these events. 
While the country welcomed the world, Bulgarians also traversed the globe, sending economic, scientific, technical, educational, and cultural experts throughout the world. These Bulgarian representatives advertised the successes of their country as they helped launch industrial plants and agricultural enterprises, provided medical and dental care, constructed homes and public buildings, and taught technical and scientific skills to emerging post-colonial elites. This image here on the bottom right is my family in Nigeria in the late 1970s. And you can see my mom and dad and my brother and myself at a, a sending away party after the completion of my father's tenure as a um, you know, uh, instructor at a polytechnic school in uh, Nigeria. So just one example of these sorts of contacts that were established between Eastern Europeans and various actors around the world. But in addition to this more um, uh, conventional, I might say, methods of contact, because there were various you know, exchanges of economic nature, what we're seeing is that at the same time, Bulgarians opened museum and arts exhibit, presided over book discussions and film screenings, uh, received musical and performance prizes, and spoke about the importance of preserving one's historical heritage and making culture accessible to the masses. You see a Bulgarian exhibition in New Delhi, another one in Vienna, and this is actually a concert at Carnegie Hall in the United States, just a few examples. Now, by official record, between 1977 and 1981, Small Bulgaria, with a population of 8.7 million in 1975, organized over, where is it, 38,000 events, cultural events around uh, the globe. Now, this, uh, and I'll talk more about the logic of these events. Now, it is very likely, this is a document uh, produced by the Sociological Institute of the Bulgarian Communist Party for reporting purposes. So it is very likely that this, um, that these numbers are exaggerated. But what matters here is the geography of cultural contact, not so much the numbers, because what you're clearly seeing is that in addition to the almost 8,000 events on the top right in the Soviet Union and the rest of the socialist states, they were cultural events throughout the globe with whopping 15,000 events in Asia, right? Which constituted roughly 50% of the cultural events organized by small Bulgaria around the globe. And then you have Latin America, Africa, Arab states, and you know, other states featured uh, here. So in my book and in this talk, I want to ask what was a small socialist state doing on the global cultural scene? And what was the purpose and the outcome of these cultural events as they were organized in you know, all of these uh, different locations? And I will pick actually several case studies to show you here. Now, why did I decide to write this book? I grew up myself a child of developed socialism uh, in Bulgaria in the 1970s and 1980s. And you can see a picture of me on the left enthusiastically becoming a member of the communist youth of Bulgaria. Yes, exactly. So, you know, this is also a book about my childhood. But also, as I mentioned previously, in the late 1970s, my, went, my family actually went to Bulgaria and worked and lived in Bulgaria for two years. My dad featured as a graduation ceremony in this polytechnic school in Auchi, um, close to Benin in, in Nigeria. My mom was a pediatrician. And then this is me and my brother with our teachers in the elementary school, in the polytechnic school. Uh, and what you're seeing is we're actually wearing a uniform featuring the colors of the Nigerian flag, green and white there. So for me, the choice of this topic was also personal because I both wanted to explore the importance of this event for socialist Bulgaria, but also the meaning of cultural contact to the rest of the uh, world. So let me just give you some idea uh, what exactly were these events and what exactly the logic behind these events were. So the ambitious cultural program that small Bulgaria launched around the world in the late, late 1970s had a clear objective to celebrate a national anniversary in 1981, 1300 years since the establishment of the medieval Bulgarian state in 681. 
So it's on occasion of this anniversary that the communist elites in charge of the country launched this ambitious cultural uh, program. The, co the goal was to inform the world of the rich historical contributions of the one of the oldest states of Europe, as the Bulgarians presented themselves, but also to advertise the contemporary achievements of modern socialist Bulgaria. Conveniently, the year 1981 also marked the 90th anniversary of the establishment of the Bulgarian Communist Party. So merging those two me messages actually was pretty easy from the ideological purposes of the regime. And what you see this, you know, attention to past, present, and future. So the past 681, the present 1981 today, right? And then the communist future that is going to be built uh, sometime in not very uh, distant uh, future. In Bulgaria and globally, there were various events organized. And you can see this year, you're going to keep seeing this year 681 because that was the key year, right? Of the anniversary. So, I mean, you see some of these events. Uh, I mean, what I basically want to emphasize here that there were domestic events, but also international events. In the middle there is the logo used for uh, international consumption of the anniversary that appears in the foreign press during uh, this uh, time uh, period. Now, in the larger book project, <clears throat> I examine these cultural contacts on several levels. I start, the, my first chapter deals with uh, the internal purposes, the domestic purposes of these cultural events and domestic uses of culture for the communist elites in charge of the country. Then I sort of like expand in concentric circles and just, hold on, we have actually a little laser, don't we? Where is that laser? Ah, uh, well, I can't point it there, but that's okay. Uh, uh, then, you know, I go in concentric circles from the, I expand to the Balkans, there's the second chapter. Then I look at Western Europe in the United States, Bulgarian contact with the West. Then I also examine the role of uh, cultural contact in emigre communities. So I look at the diaspora. Oh my goodness, what did I do? Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, someone should have told me. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about today. I look uh, at Bulgarian interactions with the global south. Uh, and I look at Bulgarian interactions with India, Mexico, and Nigeria, because methodologically, I wanted to pick a case study from different geographical locations. So I have one from South Asia, one from Mexico, right? I mean, I actually was considering Argentina, but we went with, with uh, Mexico and then one uh, from uh, Nigeria. And I can talk about these choices uh, later on. Now, what I'm offering here is a pericentric perspective. That is, I'm centering the periphery. Uh, and uh, that is a perspective used by international history for good 20 years now. It has been done extensively with other smaller countries, but not with Bulgaria. And what I'm trying to do here is to center the historical experience of a small state to emphasize the importance of actors on the margins in, the, in our understanding how the global order works. We have numerous frameworks that allow us to appreciate the power of the weak, the agency of the periphery, or the advantages of backwardness in how political and social dynamics unfold. What I am doing here is to center what I call the advantages of smallness, to claim that in the Cold War, formulating a country's goal from the positions of geopolitical marginality could provide that state with unexpected opportunities. Given that the superpowers viewed culture as secondary to political, economic, or military objectives, cultural diplomacy emerged as a good strategy for smaller states to articulate and project their global visions. In other words, being situated on the margins allows a small place unique openings to find their place and voice in the world. So this is sort of like my framework with which I approach the material. Now, what, and I'm showing you here like um, a selection of, you know, quotations that illustrate the importance of small states, right, in late socialism coming from a variety of different pers perspectives and voices. And also something I want to emphasize here is that Bulgaria also had very active contacts with other smaller states, such as notably Greece and Austria, 
two of the countries that I'm showing here. Uh, so uh, we can also talk about you know, this issue, uh, the, this question of advantages of smallness in the Q&A. Now, what we also need to understand that this cultural um, context that I'm exploring in the book occurred in the context of Cold War cultural diplomacy. Uh, and ever since 1956, 1958, what we're seeing is we have the emergence of a vibrant cultural exchange program between first the Soviet Union and the United States in 1958, which then included all of the countries in the Eastern and Western blocs. So I'm also interpreting this event through the sphere of cultural diplomacy, uh, through uh, the understanding that they were part of the battle for the hearts and minds. And from that point of view, uh, what culture did in the Bulgarian, but also state socialist context in general, is function as an extension to ideology, because it was really linked to, with the core ideas and the core understandings of state rights, citizenship that East and West, you know, held. And again, I can uh, talk more about that. Uh, and we have an extensive literature out there on US jazz diplomacy, on the importance, right? I mean, of ballet diplomacy, we discussed this with the students uh, a little bit uh, earlier. And what we know is that those sorts of cultural um, products, cultural events, cultural contacts really functioned as really Cold War weapons throughout uh, this uh, time period. So this is the larger context here. And I'm showing you well, the famous kitchen debate between Khrushchev and Vice President Nixon here. But I mean, the bottom line is that cultural exchange uh, agreements really became part of the ideological context in which the Cold War uh, unfolded. And this importance of ideal or ideology is critical in my book. What I'm showing you here is that the jacket of my book is actually based on a propaganda poster uh, made for the 30th anniversary of the socialist revolution in Bulgaria in 1974. So in other words, some of these cultural events I am discussing in this book served specifically the ideological purposes of the regime, and they were a manifestation of propaganda, right? But we need to also think about the role of culture in general, because once culture transcends boundaries, it also functions on its own, not necessarily within the ideological and propaganda confines that the regime might have in mind. But culture has the effect of being able to create new contacts and new interactions between actors in the global perspective. So this is like the tension of cultural exchange that is both tightly controlled, but then also produces unintended consequences. And this is like at the core or the argument uh, in uh, my book uh, as well. Then another key um, issue to understand here is that there is a lively literature on the global Cold War, which has shown us decisively that the Cold War cannot be understood just as a bipolar model between East and West. But the only way to really think about the Cold War is adopting a multipolar perspective that also inserts the importance of the third world in the interactions between East and West. And this multipolar perspective is at the bottom, it's you know, in the basis of the way I, I uh, analyze uh, events. And we have a growing literature that actually also shows the importance of the presence of the second world, that is the Soviet bloc, in the third world. So my, my book is part of that um, new literature that is showing the importance of Eastern European actors in particularly in various global settings. And we have a very lively literature that is also showing us, and I can talk more about this in, in the Q&A, uh, the importance of what is now being termed uh, socialist globalization or alternative globalization. That is global connectivity outside of the, pre of the dominant Western model based on premises of Westernization and adoption of free market principles. In other words, there are other globalizations out there. 
Globalization is not a singular thing. And this is what my book also is trying to show through these uh, cultural contacts. And one more uh, thing to emphasize here is that that is perhaps unexpected for a communist state. But what is very clear when we start examining the cultural contacts that Bulgaria tried to establish during this time period is that they both had global models, but they also sought actively global models and counter models. In other words, they didn't only study the Soviet experience when they tried to put together a cultural program. But in the case of Bulgaria, some of the other anniversaries that they studied here might include some unexpected influences, such as they studied the bicentennial of the American Revolution uh, in 1776. They studied on the left top, uh, this is uh, actually the Iranian anniversary of the 25th, 25th, uh, 25th uh, anniversary of the establishment of the uh, Empire Osiris of uh, the Great in Persepolis. This is actually Persepolis, the Polish millennium. They studied Romania. They studied also, you know, the uh, independence of Belgium. So the global models were very much what was informing, uh, you know, uh, these um, cultural uh, messages. And then finally, something that we are realizing more and more is that the Bulgarian communist leader, Todor Zhivkov, who was the leader in charge of the country for a very long time period from 1956 on, actually had become by the late 1970s, one of the most traveled Eastern European leaders. We don't necessarily know or expect that because Bulgaria has the reputation of being the most loyal Soviet satellite. Uh, but what we are actually seeing is that because the Bulgarian leader did not face any internal challenges in the 1970s, he was able to travel in many places. So just one example, 1976, he extended state visits to India, uh, Libya, you can see him with Gaddafi right there on the bottom, Tunisia, Iran, and Iraq. And he accepted uh, visitors from Ethiopia. You can see him with Mengistu Hele Meriam here on the bottom. Um, Tanzania, Somalia, Vietnam, Laos, Egypt, Angola, Mozambique, and Mexico, right? So, I mean, you can see really these global contacts that uh, the regime is establishing uh, throughout you know, the world with various uh, regimes. So this is the, the, the bigger context. So now I'm gonna transition to the second part of the talk where I want to actually flesh out uh, how exactly these cultural contacts are operating in India uh, and Mexico uh, specifically. So India and Mexico were by far the two most important international partners of Bulgaria from the late 1970s on. And um, Bulgaria established diplomatic relations with India in 1954. Um, with Mexico, it only established relations in 1974 and opened an embassy in 1975. But in the late 1970s, you have vibrant cultural contacts between the two countries. There was much to criticize in the internal affairs uh, of the new Bulgarian partners from the perspective of Bulgarian diplomats, from the perspective <coughs> of a communist regime. Bulgarian diplomats actually often spoke about contradictions uh, in the policies of India uh, and Mexico. Yet they were determined to resolve those contradictions in order to be able to uh, continue uh, those contacts. And I'm just gonna give you some examples here. In 1977, Bulgaria established a cultural informational center in New Delhi um, to popularize the achievements of the new life in our country. That's the quote. The center published a glossy monthly ma magazine, News from Bulgaria, here on the top, to advertise Bulgarian political, economic, and cultural accomplishments. The University of Delhi established a Bulgarian language professorship in 1977. <clears throat> enrolling 15 students to study Bulgarian language and culture. You see here on the bottom, a recital of Bulgarian uh, poetry uh, in the University of Delhi. And between 77 and uh, 1980, Bulgarian diplomats had held 76 exhibitions, organized 242 film projections, 56 uh, celebratory meetings, distributed 628,000 copies of books and magazines, and 
held 320 visits of cultural character between Bulgaria and India. This is a huge number of cultural events that had happened in the course of four uh, years. In 1980, there were 82 Bulgarian Indian friendship societies representing over 150,000, mind you, dual paying members, people who paid membership fee to participate in the society. They didn't just like show up, they actually paid the fee to be able uh, you know, to participate in these events. Uh, and then some other examples, Bulgarian cultural efforts with Mexico were not as wide range as in India, given the fact that they had begun literally from scratch in 1976, but nevertheless, you see a plethora of various exhibitions and events that were also held uh, in uh, Mexico. Now, the climax of the cultural extravaganza between these countries occurred in 1981, the year of this anniversary that I spoke about previously. And what happened during this time period is that the, okay, so I didn't actually talk about Ludmila Zhivkova, who is pictured right here, is, was the daughter of the Bulgarian communist dictator, Todor Zhivkov, and she became the Minister of Culture uh, at age 35, and she was in charge of making many of these decisions. So I'm going to actually emphasize the importance of that, the, you know, these communist elites who are making those decisions. So in 1981, she flew first to New Delhi to open the Thracian Treasures from Bulgaria exhibition, came back to Sofia, visited with her children for 12 hours, then flew to um, Mexico to open another exhibition, met with President Lopez um, Portillo, presented him with a medal, also met with Indira Gandhi. So really high profile cultural events. Uh, and what I want to emphasize here is this importance of elites uh, and particularly of communist uh, elites. The, uh, Importance of the strong personal relationship that developed between political leaders at the highest level was instrumental in the organization of these events. A close relationship developed between Gandhi and Zhivkova, both daughters of leaders that took their countries in radical new directions. Their personal patronage played an important part in this intense uh, you know, cultural relations between the two uh, uh, countries. Similarly, in Mexico, highly placed women played an important role. As Zivkova became close to First Lady Carmen Romano, pictured over there on the right, who similarly hosted receptions, museum openings, ceremonies honoring Zivkova. When Zivkova visited these two countries on official state trips, she often took days off to travel to ancient archaeological sites. You can see some of these images on the bottom represent these days off to um, meet with gurus and sages and to explore her personal interest in meditation, theosophy, yoga, or vegetarianism. In other words, the lady had interests uh, and she used state policy, cultural state policy, as a vehicle of satisfying these personal interests. All right, so that is a cynic interpretation, cynical interpretation, and I can talk more about it. But that was one of the things that uh, you know happened uh, here. So quickly, I want to go uh, quickly over what happened uh, in Nigeria and then draw out some larger conclusions. Bulgaria established relations with Nigeria in 1964, four years after its independence from Britain. Relations between the two countries were not particularly robust until the mid 1970s. Now, Nigeria went through a civil war between 1967 and 1970. And the Bulgarians actually got involved in the civil war when the Soviets invited them to import weapons to the federal government uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Lagos. Um, when the war ended, the new military regime in charge of Nigeria started a vast uh, economic program of developing the petroleum reserves in the country. This is you know, the beginning of the boom in uh, Nigerian oil production, uh, but also Nigeria underwent a, a huge state investment in vast infrastructure projects of development, which also included the moving of the capital from Lagos on the coast to Biafra, uh, no, uh, not Biafra, um, uh, to um, Abuja in the middle of the country in order to try and unify, uh, to, uh, unify uh, the state. And this is how the Bulgarians got involved in Nigeria because they offered help 
in this construction um, project. What the, the, what the Bulgarians really wanted is to land contracts, uh, the building contracts, construction contracts, helping with the, you know, these new infrastructure projects that were emerging. At the same time, they were training trade union leaders. And you see here on the bottom, uh, trade union activists uh, in the Bulgarian embassy in uh, Lagos being trained by Bulgarian diplomats. And actually it was under the leadership of Bulgarian diplomats that Nigerian uh, trade unions celebrated May 1st for the first time in their history. And uh, you can see here, though uh, this uh, you know, um, image uh, of the Nigerian Labor Congress, one of those trade unions that worked closely uh, with the Bulgarians. So uh, we can talk more about that. But I want to emphasize that in Nigeria, the Bulgarian aspirations were mainly of economic nature. What the Bulgarians wanted was to land contracts, to generate hard currency for the regime. Yet the way they pursued it also included cultural means. They basically used culture as a first step towards establishing contact with their Nigerian hosts and then pursued economic uh, interests as well. One example, the most striking example of this merging of economic and cultural cooperation was the fact that the Bulgarians landed a contract to build the National Theater in Lagos in 1972. This was a massive building that was actually um, uh, constructed on the model of a building that uh, you know, uh, exists in Bulgaria, uh, uh, the uh, Palace of Sports and Youth in Varna on the Black Sea, but it exceeded the prototype six times. And the importance of this structure is that actually Nigeria in 1977 uh, hosted the second World Festival of African, what's the exact uh, title? Uh, the, uh, the second World Black and African Festival of arts and culture uh, in 1977. This the National Theater was used for that celebration. And on occasion of that, Bulgarians also participated in the festival. In other words, they sent cultural representatives to the festival. So you see very clearly this merging of economic uh, and cultural uh, objectives in uh, this, um, in this um, events. And then the Bulgarians also signed a program for cultural and educational cooperation, tried to organize various cultural events. Most often these cultural events included traveling photo exhibits, and there are some of those featured here, and you can see these panels, right, laminated panels that the diplomats carried around. What is interesting to see in these events, um, next image is again, this anniversary, 681 was there, right? What also you're seeing in mean, some of these images show you again, the importance of culture. This is what the Bulgarians felt they had to show their, um, their hosts. The image on the top is a very interesting document. This is actually the competition, do you know Bulgaria? Uh, that was circulated among students in Lagos uh, which has several questions, tried answering them. Uh, I could not answer all of them. Some of them are very specific to the situation in Bulgaria. Others are very specific to Nigerian-Bulgarian relations. Um, but what this promises you is a one week free board and room on the Black Sea, uh, right? Which was very attractive to Nigerian students. So these were the sort of events, if you're wondering what exactly are Bulgarians doing, what, what, what sort of events are they organizing? This is the sort of, of events they're organizing. And what are they talking about to their Nigerian hosts? This is one quotation uh, of a transcript from a speech that gives you an idea how the Bulgarians again merge this economic and cultural, uh, you know, um, uh, mark, I mean, uh, language. On the one hand, they're mentioning the anniversary, the 13th centuries of the foundation of the Bulgarian state, but then they're talking about the victory of the people's revolution and how Bulgaria is a developed state that can offer advice to the Nigerians. So again, you have this merging of uh, economic and cultural uh, interests. So to wrap up, and I'm sorry if I'm taking longer than I intended, but why were the Bulgarians heavily invested in international culture during this time? This type of na nation branding serves the domestic and international policy agenda of Bulgaria's communist regime. At home, 
the extensive state-sponsored attention given to culture sought to energize society and bolster the authority of the communist elites in charge of the country by creating new visions of national unity and historical pride. Abroad, the events pursued prestige-making goals by seeking to revise the image of the Zhivkov regime as the most loyal ally of the Soviet Union, while emphasizing Bulgaria's national uniqueness and contributions to humanity. But soft power aspirations also contributed to hard power goals, as cultural outreach facilitated a series of new political, economic, and cultural partnerships across the globe. Bulgaria now had dynamic, multifaceted relations with Greece, Austria, West Germany, France, India, Mexico, Nigeria, Japan, and other countries. There is no doubt, in other words, that cultural diplomacy provided a good strategy for the small socialist state to redefine its global standing in concrete ways. Even in the reluctant um, admission of Radio Free Europe, which was extremely anti-communist, right? Uh, a Bulgaria's new cultural prominence, quote, offset Western views of the country as a Balkan backwater or Soviet satrapy, end quote. Very, very eloquent. However, here, I also want to make a larger claim about the bigger picture of these Bulgarian engagements with the global South. In all of these cases, Bulgarian the Bulgarian cultural programs made possible the articulation of new global imaginaries, which linked a small country on the margins of Europe with some of the most prominent world civilizations. So I want to emphasize the importance of this civilizational message or civilizational rhetoric. Now, there are two aspects of the civilizational message. On the one hand, the Bulgarian officials operated under the assumptions of their own uncontested Europeanness. They saw themselves as Europeans going around the world, right? And we can talk about that too, because in Nigeria, that is particularly prominent. And, and the racialization of this cultural contact is very much part of this picture. Uh, but at the same time, on another, you know, on another level, they continuously asserted the image of Bulgaria as an equal peer of other grand world civilizations. In other words, they wanted to be seen as a grand world civilization. And I have given you here one of these quotes that talks about this, you know, uh, this idea about Bulgaria and, uh, and, uh, and India being representatives of two of the most ancient civilizations, right? So this civilizational language was very much part of what was going on. And ultimately, these linkages created alternative cultural geographies that challenged dominant narratives centered on Western civilization while inscribing the importance of Bulgaria's history and culture into a global rather than just European civilizational context. Now, I want to emphasize that these endeavors were rooted in nationalistic aspirations. So this is part of like, you know, the nationalist agenda of the communist elites. However, this agenda had an impact because it followed universal models and pursued novel global partnerships. And finally, these observations about Bulgaria are in line with recent studies that emphasize the new channels and notions of global connectivity in the context of the Cold War. In the last five years, we have increasingly gained a new understanding of the active role of the Eastern European states in the developing world, which has challenged routinely Western ideas of cooperation with the global South and offered alternative ideas of development that brought East and South together. Here, Bulgaria's cultural efforts in the global South highlight the ability of a small state to influence the cultural imagination of the 1970s by pursuing channels of communication and contacts beyond the East-West competition for the global order. Such alternative global connections actively shape the world from the margins, creating mental geography, geographies outside of East-West or North-South considerations to craft new global visions along an East-South axis instead. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Absolutely. You've been standing for all so long. It is great to stand, actually. <laughs> I think that works.
Is that working? Cool. And, um, yeah. So I have a lot of questions and I'm going to abuse my prerogative as the person who's here and ask them, uh, or at least some of them. But if you want to ask a question, catch my eye and I'll, um, and, um, and we'll, we'll make that happen too. I promise I won't just ask questions this whole time. Um, so I think there's kind of, I have two micro questions and then at least one macro question. And I'm gonna start with the micro ones first because no, this is going to be an event. No, this is gonna be an event of extremes. Um, so one of the things, there's a lot that I really enjoyed about the book. And one of the things that I especially enjoyed are the personalities, right? And I think that well, there's often kind of this image uh, associated with the, the Eastern Bloc, the Soviet uh, Union and its uh, partner states, partner in kind of varying degrees of air quotes there, um, of being gray and boring. Um, they were in fact home to some of the most fascinating and colorful personalities that you know have ever lived. And in your book, you highlight too, and I wanna ask you to talk a little bit about them. Um, and the first is within Bulgaria, uh, good old Ludmila um, In this country, I guess we've been talking more recently about leaders appointing their children to, posi to position of responsibility. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how someone who was interested in sort of Eastern spiritualism, uh, and consorted with not exactly this, the, let's say the, the usual dictator in crowd, uh, fit into a country like Bulgaria and this whole project of sort of yeah. cultural production. Got it. Do you want me to take this one or do you want to ask the other questions? I'll ask the other one because maybe, um, so the other one, uh, no, actually answer that one and then we'll go back to me. That is a long one. Yeah, I know. So Ludmila Zivkova is a fascinating person. Yeah. So she was the only competent child of the dictator because the son was completely incompetent. Uh, the son was profligate and a drunkard and he just uh, was no good. So her father embraced her and groomed her to replace him. She uh, did her PhD at Oxford. Uh, she actually wrote uh, a dissertation on American, no, uh, on, on British Bulgarian relations. Um, and uh, she then became actually a minister of culture at the tender age of 35. Um, she also became a part of the Politburo very soon. So it's clear that he was grooming her uh, as an heir. Uh, yes, she had interests. Uh, she uh, particularly had interest in India uh, and ancient Indian philosophies. Um, she was a follower of theosophy. She actually was a big fan of a, well, do you know Nicholas Rorick? Nikolai Rorich. So he was an emigre from an artist from the Soviet Union who eventually moved to India and who actually lived uh, on the uh, foothills of the Himalaya. Uh, and he, she actually loved his art. So she would often visit him there. And then she organized a huge exhibition of his works in Bulgaria and actually started collecting art from India, from uh, in Mexico, from Japan, from Africa, and put um, launched this um, Museum of International Art and Culture in Bulgaria, which was a completely new project that had nothing to do with socialist internationalism and all that, right? So, um, I mean, she was a worldly oriented person. Uh, she spoke Sanskrit. Uh, so she's, often her press conferences were sprinkled <laughs> with quotations in the original Sanskrit. And actually in the international press, um, there was this fascination with her. I mean, first she was a woman, right? Uh, and she was young. Uh, and also she has these unorthodox interests and that created this image of freshness, this image of someone who is thinking outside of the box and who is bringing something new and fresh to 
Bulgarian culture. Yet, she was the prime example of nepotism <laughs> in a current, you know, in a state that it was based on, you know, elites doing whatever they wanted to do, right? So Brezhnev, the Soviet Union, often criticized Todor Zhivko for that and often criticized Zhivko that he was giving a bad appearance to communist regimes. Well, his daughter was busy marrying circus acrobats. Uh, well, so I'm telling you, you look, Mimo was a gem. <laughs> compared, and she was often compared to Niku Ceausescu, who was a scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> so when you actually have to be compared to these sort of people, right? Uh, you suddenly appear as the most competent of communist children. Uh, right? uh, and this is what happened. So that leads me to the second question I wanted to ask, which is about another one of my favorite Eastern Bloc personalities, Nicolae Ceausescu. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> and, you know, not favorite in a normative sense. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, in part because I'm supposed to get on a plane yes. to Romania on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to retell this story because there's new people here. And I, um, so on, on Sunday of this past weekend, I was on the phone with my mother, which, you know, I do, and you should all do, you know, mothers like these things. Um, and uh, we were, she was saying, you know, so are you, are you going to head off to Romania? Is that still going to happen? And I said, yeah, you know, um, got to pull the bandaid off at some point. Let's do this. Um, and so there was some, you know, back and forth about the wisdom of this course of action, of which my mother remains not fully persuaded. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm only in my early 30s. So what do I know about these things? She wanted to make sure that I was you know, really thinking about this. Um, and so, you know, it goes on and on. And my mother who's from Slovakia, uh, Czechoslovakia formerly, and she would call herself Czechoslovak. She wouldn't call herself Slovak. Um, she's of that age. Uh, said, well, okay, fine. You know, that's fine. At least you're not going to Bulgaria. <laughs> and it got me thinking about the sort of the hierarchies right, the people create within even what is presented often as a pretty homogenous world, right? It got me thinking about how some countries we think of as Eastern Bloc, but people in the Eastern Bloc think of as being really more Balkan or more Mediterranean or yeah. more, you know, Turkish, um, you know, Ottoman Empire, um, all that stuff. But of course, I, I can't leave this question without asking about Bulgaria's erstwhile neighbor, Romania, because so often we think about these countries in this period of time, and we think about, again, this kind of homogenous nature, but really culture was almost a weapon in some of the ways you talk about, not against the capitalists, right, but against the revisionists in Bucharest, who were, who were also communists. Can you talk a little bit about this kind of weaponization of culture within the Eastern Bloc context? All right, so the context in the Balkans was extremely complicated because in the late Cold War, the Balkans really represented this variety of geopolitical and ideological positions that don't deeply fit the bloc mentality. Uh, you have Yugoslavia, which is a non-aligned socialist state not following the Soviet role, all right, the Soviet uh, model. Uh, you have a Romania and Ceausescu um, who is friends with the Chinese, uh, and we don't speak to the Chinese because we are on the Soviet side. Uh, but then at the same time, Ceausescu is this terrible dictator, but then actually the United States supports him because he is irking the Soviets, right? So you have that going on. Uh, then you have Greece and Greece is a NATO country, but Greece is really angry with the United States because the United States have actually been supporting the junta all these years and they are threatening to actually close um, US military bases, right? So Greece has its own agenda 
And Greece wants to have an active Balkan agenda because it actually wants to create that as a counterbalance to the US influence in the country. At the same time, Greece is also pursuing membership in the EEC also to create a counterbalance to solve it, or excuse me, to NATO and you know, US influence in the country. And then you have Turkey, which in 1980 experiences a military coup. Uh, but then Turkey is actually really complicated because in 74, you have the whole Cyprus thing. And the Bulgarians are very, very, so right, you have the Turkish invasion of Cyprus and like the seizure of North Cyprus. And the Bulgarians are very nervous that Bulgaria has a large Turkish minority. What is this going to do to the Turkish minority, right? So they all these considerations. And many of these considerations have nothing to do with the Cold War per se. What they have to do is land, history, populations, minorities, right? Historical claims and a range of other things that in the end make it possible for Bulgaria to become close with Greece, which is a NATO state, but not being able to have a good contact, uh, cultural contact with either Romania and Ceausescu, right? Or Yugoslavia, the other socialist state. Because at the same time, Bulgaria is also arguing with Yugoslavia about Macedonia, which is, it's arguing up until today yeah. about the same <laughs> things, right? So very deja vu. So in other words, what you're seeing here is that from a regional viewpoint, geopolitics does not matter as much as regional cooperation and other ways of establishing contact. And there's this whole thing going on about, are we going to do bilateral cooperation? Are we going to do multilateral cooperation? Can we actually pull it off? Does this benefit us? Does it not benefit us? So, I mean, that is not a neat answer, but I think that is just like the short answer is it's complicated and the Cold War is not everything. So I'm gonna squeeze one last question and, and then I'll open up the floor. Um, you, you sort of, tease this in your talk, and I wanna ask you to sort of drive the point home. Um, you talked about the advantages of smallness. Yes. And I am, this is on my mind a lot lately because as you all know, uh, Canada, a small country where I am from, recently absolutely cleaned the clocks of the American women's hockey team in the Olympics. <laughs> uh, and will do so again in the gold medal game, I'm sure, just as the Canadian men uh, we'll show the Americans what's what in all future male Olympic hockey competitions to come. Not that I care about this stuff. You know, we, I mean, sports diplomacy, lots of great stuff there too. Uh, Canada's a small country. The United States is not insignificantly bigger in many ways, uh, except for territory, obviously. What are, as you tease, what are the advantages of being small? Because you talked about this and, and I'm, I'm dying to know what are the advantages of being small? When you ask the question this way, it's terrible. <laughs> All right. So there, so being small is not a good thing. And you're always being told that you're small and insignificant. And because you're constantly being told you're small and insignificant, at some point you actually have to make the best of your situation because there's no changing the fact that you are small. So you have to take that perspective. And I'm sorry, but that's not the Canadian perspective, right? <laughs> so if you're coming from the per Canadian perspective, you can be snarky and ask me, what is the advantage of smallness? But if I'm coming from the Bulgarian perspective, I will tell you I'm small, so I can just do the best out of this, right? So, uh, so what can you do? You can go to Big Brother, the Soviets. And you can say, oh, eternal friendship. We are your best and most loyal ally. We are never going to betray you. We're going to follow the Soviet line. But can you give us that oil that you've been giving us for free? Because it's the 1970s and there's oil gluts and we really need oil. So can we please continue with these oil imports? Because we are your most loyal ally. And it's just a little bit of all for you, and it doesn't really matter. It, we are small, and it's not going to matter, but it's really going to look good, right? So this is one advantage of smallness. You, so you play up that card, right? It doesn't matter that much. 
Then the other advantage of smallness is that when you go to Nigeria, when you go to India, when you go to Mexico, you say, you know what? We are not an imperialist power. We were never part of empires. We actually were oppressed by a series of empires. So we understand you. We understand that you were under the British. We understand that, you know, how the British suppressed you because we were also under the Ottoman Empire and we were one small country and we understand how you felt. So we have commonalities with you. So can we do business, please? Because we understand you. That's another, uh, you know, advantage of smallness. And then from a cultural viewpoint, what the advantage of smallness is that you can say we have our unique culture that we want to export and do in a way we want to do. And you know what? Culture is not that important in the end. You know, what you really care is geopolitics, the economy, military deals, political decisions. Let us do our culture the way we want to do it. And that also provides you with source of legitimacy domestically, because you can say, hey, you know what? We are not actually just the satellite. Look at us. We have this proud history. We are doing things that matter. We are a big civilization, even though we are a small country. And this is how you draw out the importance of smallness when you say we are a small country, but in the spheres of culture, there are no small and big states. And we as a small country have done more than many of the bigger states. Does this answer your question, sir? It does. <laughs> I swear we could just keep talking about Olympic hockey, but that's probably not the best way forward. Anyway, I saw a question over here, and then we'll make our way around the room. Yes, thank you so much. This is really interesting. Um, I, my question is riffing off of what you just said, but it comes back to just the idea of the Bulgarians being the, the best ally, the, the, the most loyal yes. to the Soviet regime. And I also heard you just say, this is not an empire. And you know where my brain will go in this. <laughs> We've known each other for a while. Um, empire always comes up. My question, though, is when um, when Bulgaria goes out to promote Bulgaria, is there any resistance from Moscow yeah. to that campaign? Is there any effort to control the narrative in order to ensure that the Soviet narrative is privileged yeah. against the national narrative? This is a great question and only going to the Russian Soviet archives can answer that. I chose in this project not to pursue that for various reasons, logistical, financial, family, and whatnot. I also wanted, honestly, to not do that uh, because I really wanted to actually explore the East South more because that's what's new now. Uh, so my sense is uh, well, we know that Brezhnev was really irked. He regularly summoned Zhivkov and he scolded him that he allows his daughter to do this. He felt that was an embarrassment. He also thought that uh, the promotion of nationalism within the socialist bloc is a bad idea. And he read the Bulgarian cultural efforts as an expression of nationalism. So he also wanted to control the message this way. And also the Soviets were irked that the Bulgarians were going around the world saying that they were the most important Slavic civilization <laughs> because they have given the world, excuse me, smallness, the Cyrillic <laughs> alphabet, right? So, right, the Cyrillic alphabet um, uh, originates in Bulgaria. If anyone needs to hear this from me. <laughs> Don't you forget it. <laughs> right? Small countries give something to the world as well. Uh, but what was important here is that that was really, right? I mean, something that the Soviets did not appreciate. Mm -hmm. So there were various tensions there. And that's also the reason why the Soviets ultimately, they so few events organized in the Soviet bloc compared to the rest of the world, because those events were not welcome in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you so much for coming. This is a really interesting um, discussion. Um, something that I honestly do not know a lot about. Um, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that Bulgaria like to associate itself with Europe um, and as like a, a part of Europe. So can you speak to how their the like duality of being European but also being Slavic uh, at the same time and having these connections to Russia? 
Perfect. So, so here, here, here it is. Um, it's a great question. And I think what the Bulgarians were trying to do is challenge the premise of duality. They were basically saying Slavic civilization is part of European civilization. We cannot understand Europe without understanding Slavic civilization, which is one of the core European civilizations. And they were going with the whole premise that we are one of the oldest states uh, in Europe, 681. Unlike you, the barbarians in the Germanic and French lands, which didn't even have, you know, unified centralized state organization during this time period, right? Uh, I mean, not to talk about the Anglo-Saxons, not until the 11th century. What did you have? Nothing. And we, in the meantime, had all of the civilization. So, I mean, the whole idea here is actually to accept Slavic civilization as European civilization and to also recognize that there is culture and civilization before the Renaissance. So that's another thing that the, the Bulgarians are doing. They are going around talking about the Byzantines, that is Eastern or Eastern Roman Empire, as part of the common European civilization, common European heritage. So one of the agendas is basically restoring the place of all of these civilizations to their rightful place as European civilizations, if this makes sense. Carl. Yes, so I just wanted to ask a question. Um, earlier in your conversation, you discussed all this part of, um, of, let's say, a way of trying to have an alternative form of civilization. And I was curious to see if did that all feel well after well, the Tumblr fell? Or can we still today see examples of other countries that are trying to do the alternative forms of civilization? Thank you. This is such a great question. Um, so, in terms of, so what is becoming clear from the literature that there is definitely something that we could provisionally, tentatively call socialist, uh, uh, excuse me, socialist globalization, which was advertising the way the second world does things, right? Which is mainly state-led development rather than free market-led development. And, you know, all sorts of like, you know, attention to social projects rather than, you know, just let everyone educate themselves however they can uh, and so forth. Now, what ultimately happened with the end of the Cold War in 1989, 1991, Western, Western globalization won and very successfully erased the historical experiences and memories of alternative modes of globalization by proclaiming, you might remember the end of history and all that, right? All of these arguments and you know the, the, the victory of democracy in the free market as the only model forward. You know, and these are, this is what globalization was supposed to mean. Globalization is westernization. Everyone is going to follow that model. Now, clearly, today we have various challenges to this model, most notably China, right? But I mean, there are other challenges out there. So I think this is in this contemporary moment, we definitely need to be paying attention to what makes globalization successful and when globalizations ultimately fail. Uh, because I think that we can use some of these historical lessons to honestly, I, I'm not in the business of predicting the future at all. But, you know, I mean, we can look for these tensions that indicate, you know, complexity, that indicate that something is not going right. Uh, so, I mean, it's a great question. And, um, I mean, I hope that more people actually use this framework to explain events. Um, because, again, it's a new term in the literature. <laughs> yeah, Rothka? Yeah, um, this has been a really interesting discussion. Thank you. And I just wanted to ask um, a little more explanation on something that you mentioned. Uh, you said that India and Mexico were kind of the two most important countries that Bulgaria was doing cultural outreach with. And I was just wondering if you could speak more to why those two countries specifically. Uh, and I must add to, to that <clears throat> group also Japan. Uh, that was another uh, one of these countries. I ultimately decided not to include in my book because the book was becoming too big and I didn't want to have another chapter. And I didn't know where to fit Japan because Japan, right, is like a developed capitalist country. So it didn't necessarily fit in the Global South chapter. 
I couldn't just like stick it there. Uh, but uh, right, um, I had to have another another chapter, and I'm like, I'm done. Right? <laughs> I cannot do another chapter. Anyways, so um, honestly, if you ask me, I really think it is Ludmila Zhivkova, that crazy lady. <laughs> she and the, and Japan is also in this mix. She. She was responsible for turning these countries a priority. She went on a tour of East and um, South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, you know, in the 1970s. Uh, and she decided that she's going to go with India particularly. Um, she would have loved to go to China, but she couldn't have, right? So India was a good substitute for her personal interests because right, she had the whole Himalaya thing going on so she would have loved to have gone you know on the other side okay. uh, so you, uh, uh, and then with Japan too it was the same thing about other big civilizations and how we want to show the similarity between Bulgaria as a grand civilization and the, gra uh, the great civilizations of Mexico, India and Japan so I know this is a not a satisfactory answer, but I do think that was the choice of the Bulgarian princess. Now, that doesn't mean that there are not other interests there, because in Japan particularly, there are also economic interests. The Bulgarians are, you know, making contracts with various, uh, with various private companies. They're also starting a yogurt production. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, Bulgarian yogurt is huge in Japan. Check it out. I'm not making it up. <laughs> um, and this is the time when the Bulgarians actually start exporting that technology to Japan and actually making hard currency for the regime based on that. Uh, in uh, India, what the Bulgarians are doing, there is a new book coming up. The Bulgarians are actually exporting computers to India. And the uh, Indians are buying Bulgarian computers. Uh, because they need computers to modernize. And the Bulgarians are offering cheap computers. IB, IBM computers are great, but they are expensive. So we are going to actually buy computers from Bulgaria. They're totally suitable. So the economic interest is there, right? But the cultural aspect of that is the result of the personal whims of this lady. Thank you so much. I went to the small group. Yeah. Inside phone, this is all the same. My question for you is Do you believe, since the Soviet Union is obviously fell in Bulgaria, has maybe lost that connection and that power base? How is, do you believe that cultural diplomacy has become a lost art for Bulgaria? I want, I want. Cultural diplomacy yeah. has become a lost art. Okay. So uh, has, it, has it decreased in importance since the USSR has okay. failed? Has it maybe even increased? Is there a reason why that has yeah. become? Because it, it, to my knowledge, and I, I haven't obviously learned too much about Bulgaria before this talk, but it seems like yeah. they were kind of a cultural juggernaut. Yeah. And I think, and this is my read, since the USSR fell, maybe that has shifted their okay. cultural narrative. Wonderful. Uh, so, um, two years ago, so was the international organization in charge of culture? UNESCO. Who was the head of UNESCO two years ago? The Bulgarian Irina Bokova, who was a two-term head of UNESCO, who actually began her career in the 1980s. She was the daughter of the editor-in-chief of Robotnicesko Delo, Filip Bokov, a Politburo member, another case of communist children. She was in charge of UNESCO during uh, the, the uh, Syrian uh, civil war. So she actually did the whole Palmyra thing. Uh, and so in other words, what I'm saying is that there are other ways in which the Bulgarians are actually having these influences now. And those are through the international organizations. The EU, the Bulgarians are very active there in cultural policy. Uh, I also am going to mention casually that the head of the IMF today is also a Bulgarian. Uh, <laughs> just, I'm just going to say, smallest, <laughs> smallest. Bulgarians in places. Bulgarians everywhere. You want to be on top of the world? Hey, <laughs> right? Uh, she 
the, the head of the IMF, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, was Stalinka Georgieva. Uh huh. I'm not kidding. <laughs> so that history is very much present. So, so what you're seeing is a nomenclatura person became a builder of capitalism after the end of the Cold War. Very quickly, the transition happened, right? So they forgot what they wanted to forget. They used the connections they had managed to establish. And they became the leader of UNESCO and the leader of the IMF. Say what you want to say. When <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have time for just one more question. And I, I thank you guys for your patience with this wonderful question. So mm -hmm. I, yeah. We have time for just one more question, Dr. Siegel. Um, well, I need to be the last question. And also, in some ways, my question got thrown off by your emphasis late in the day on Japan. Uh -huh. it, it does actually throw off my question, but it's also, we're going to leave Japan out of what I want to yes. say. And thank you for this really, really interesting talk and the wonderful book that you that you have written. Um, but but I want. I want <laughs> she, she's a friend. She's a friend. I want to talk about imperialism because, of course, one one has a hard time leaving leaving one's own interests. Um, because what you described about the Bulgarian relationship with India, with Mexico, with Nigeria, particularly in your discussion of Nigeria, in many ways sounds less like cultural diplomacy to me and more like cultural imperialism. Yeah. Uh, and this, there, this is the, an attempt to influence and to superimpose Bulgarian culture and practices in a very generous manner um, on lesser developed countries. Despite the fact, as you say, you know, that we are not, that the message was we're not imperialists. We too were under the imperial yoke Etc. Etc. Yeah. Although the Ottomans, yeah. not the not the British or or the French yeah. or, uh, or, the, or the Russian and Soviet <laughs> Empire. Um, so you know, do you really is it? Do you think it's is it really right to be calling this cultural diplomacy, or is cultural imperialism or is imperialism really more a, a more apt framework to be thinking of this in? So I don't think it's cultural imperialism because that is not the, the objective. The objective is to create partnerships and to spread the cultural message. Um, however, um, the Bulgarians behave in very, let's say, colonial ways. Uh, and they definitely exhibit what we might call colonial mentality. Especially in Nigeria, it is very clear that this is a civilizing mission. Right? I mean, it is absolutely clear that they're there to also teach the Nigerians how to do things better. And, you know, they have superior knowledge because they're white Europeans. And also these are very racialized encounters in which the Bulgarians are treating the Nigerians as different because they are also black. Uh, and, and they also distinguish between black Africa and North Africa, right? There is that, there is that whole thing going on there too. Um, so I, I really call it imperialism because it, it's hard. They believe that they're doing good to the world, which of course is increasing to imperialism. I agree. <laughs> I agree. But, it, but also, yeah, yeah, I understand. You know, I don't think that I would use that because I think it, it, I think that you lose something if you if you drop cultural diplomacy. I think that cultural diplomacy allows me personally to look at it. It, I find ideology more helpful as I think about this because then ideology is fungible and you can do multiple things with ideology in different contexts. And it may be imperialism in Africa, but it's not imperialism in Western Europe and it's not imperialism in the United States and it's not imperialism. I don't even think it's imperialism in India and Mexico because again, this is okay, small. 
I've heard that. Yes. <laughs> but that's important because you can't conquer those big states in the same way. Well, I wasn't asking you to rewrite yeah. the whole book. Yeah. No, <laughs> not happening. The book is brilliant. So. The book is brilliant, and it remains to us to thank you. Um, so you mentioned your school uniform and the colors yes. of the Nigerian flag. Um, and while we can't improve on that, um, we, can hope, we can hope to come in a close second with an AGS t-shirt. Ooh, in nice. Colors. Um, it's, um, you know, good for cultural outreach. Thank you all. And we hope to see you at the next AGS events coming up very soon. Uh, if you're not yet, get on our listserv and uh, we will see you all then. Thank you. And I just want to say, when you look at the Robinson projection, I just want you to notice how Bulgaria is right in the middle. <laughs> I don't think you've thought about it, but it is. <laughs>